All right, subcommittee will come to order. Do opening statements. I want to welcome our witness and uh, witness list, our, our panelists and uh, guest. Um, Subcommittee convenes this morning to continue its investigation into the process by which the Obama administration set fuel economy standards for cars and trucks and the impact these standards will have on small businesses and consumers. On July 29, 2011, President Obama announced his administration had come to an agreement with the State of California, labor unions, and several major auto manufacturers on increased corporate average fuel economy standards for 2017 through 2025. Previously, the administration enacted fuel economy standards for light-duty cars and trucks from the 2012 to 2016 timeline and for heavy-duty trucks from 2014 to 2018. In announcing the latest version of these standards, the President boasted that the agreement had been reached, quote, without Congress. Based on this statement and other evidence, it appears that the President has forgotten that there are, in fact, three separate but equal branches of government, and it is Congress that writes the law. In addition to forgetting about Congress, the President also forgot about his pledge to be the most transparent President in history. It appears that each of these standards were set based on a closed-door negotiations with select stakeholders and sometimes were, who sometimes were awarded with billions in Federal grants or loans, or in the case of a few, a generous taxpayer bailout. Despite the President's expressed desire to craft regulations in a way that is sensitive to their impact on job creation, the President's staff never bothered to consult with consumers or the small businesses that would be impacted by these very regulations. While the administration has argued that a future notice and comment rulemaking will cure this defect, there is reason to believe that such a process will be merely pro forma exercise and that the voice of the consumers and small businesses will never be heard because the critical elements of the regulation are already set in, some, set in stone. What is more, these new regulations do not come cheap. The 12 to 2016 standards are expected to cost manufacturers $50 billion in compliance costs. The 2017 to 2025 standards may well cost three times that amount, $150 billion. Truckers can also expect to pay a minimum of $6,000 more per truck starting in just two years. And many argue that the estimate is at the low end. Because of these concerns, Chairman Issa has sent detailed letters to the White House and the agency is asking the administration to reveal the process used to determine the standards and to be transparent with the public on the impact these higher fuel economy standards will have on future cars and trucks. We look forward to reviewing the administration's response. In addition to these procedural concerns, today's hearing will focus on the impact these fuel economy standards are expected to have on consumer choice and the safety of the vehicles. The committee wants to know how much these regulations will cost and how many consumers will be priced out of the new car market. If consumers can't afford to purchase new vehicles, what will be the impact on the many automobile dealerships that depend on new car sales for their very survival? It appears that the administration is essentially substituting its bureaucratic judgment for the independent judgment of the marketplace. When government substitutes its judgment for the private market, the result is never good. Most likely, these standards will force the auto industry to limit consumer choice and manufacture products that Americans may not want or simply cannot afford. In the case of the trucking industry, we want to know if the heavy-duty fuel economy standards are necessary, and if so, how they will impact the livelihood of independent truckers. It appears as though the administration's heavy-duty truck standards will have dire consequences for independent truckers, who are the backbone of American commerce. Independent truckers did not have a seat at the table during the administration's negotiation, but these negotiations now threaten to force them off the road. We also want to know if NHTSA has a handled on how many people may lose their life or suffer severe injury as a result of these standards. In the case of light-duty vehicles, these standards will force Americans to drive lighter weight vehicles. This has significant implications for driver safety. Moreover, if the heavy-duty trucking regulation forces independent owner operators to retire, it is possible that less experienced drivers will, will take their place. This turnover could have severe implications for highway safety as well. Regrettably, we may never know the full truth about how the 2009 standards were set because they were a result of closed-door negotiations where, according to the California Air Resources Board, Chairman Mary Nichols' participants took a, quote, vow of silence and took great pains to, quote, put nothing in writing ever, close quote. The committee wanted to ask Ms. Nichols what exactly she meant by that statement, but regrettably she has refused to appear before this panel. The committee also wanted to ask Ms. Nichols why 
her state is in the business of setting fuel economy standards at all in light of the explicit congressional preemption of state action on matters relating to fuel economy standards. In my opinion, her absence today crystallizes why the State of California should not be part of this rulemaking process. Quite simply, CARB is un unaccountable and unresponsive to the needs of the Nation and should not be in the business of establishing Federal law. With these considerations in mind, we look forward to hearing from today's witnesses. With that, I will yield to the Ranking Member of the full Committee, the gentleman from Maryland, is now recognized <coughs> for five minutes. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to welcome Administrator Strickland, Assistant Administrator McCarthy, and Director Orge for joining us today to discuss the recently announced corporate average fuel economy and greenhouse gas emission standards for automobiles for models year 2017 to 2025. I am pleased that the Obama administration is moving forward on fuel economy standards that will decrease our dependence on foreign oil, improve vehicle value for consumers, our constituents, and improve air quality across our nation. Despite what some may claim, the standards proposed by the Obama administration are not grabs from thin air. In 2007, President Bush signed into law the Energy Independence and Security Act, which set a national standard of 35 miles per gallon by 2020. President Bush praised this legislation, calling it, and I quote, a major step towards reducing our dependence on oil, confronting global climate change, expanding the production of renewable fuels, and giving future generations of our country a nation that is stronger, cleaner, and more secure." End of quote. Now, just four years later, the majority has arrived at the puzzling conclusion that improving energy efficiency is not in our national interests. Today's hearing is entitled, Running on Empty, which is a misguided criticism of fuel efficiency standards supported by the industry, consumers, and the administration. Frankly, I have a hard time understanding what the majority's problem is with the fuel efficiency standards or whose interests they are representing in opposing them. I also understand that the majority is concerned that the administration has been inappropriately colluding with stakeholders. This is also a strange claim, considering the frequent complaints from the other side about the administration seeking too little input from industry when developing regulations. While the administration has worked out a proposal that automakers support, as you will hear today, it fully intends to go through the formal rulemaking process and comply with the requirements of the Administrative Procedures Act. The new standards are critical to ensuring that consumers are getting the most for their money. According to the Union of Concerned Scientists, the new standards are expected to save average drivers, our constituents, $3,500 over the lifetime of their vehicles after factoring in the cost of new fuel technology. In recent months, several of the top automakers have reported that their customers are increasingly choosing fuel-efficient vehicles over their less efficient products. We certainly can understand that in these recessionary times. The new standards also will help create new jobs. Sears estimates that the standards could create as many as 8,400 new jobs in Maryland, my state, and 500,000 jobs nationwide by 2030. While there undoubtedly will be some challenges to meeting these standards, the substantial buy-in from industry indicates that they are achievable and ultimately will benefit consumers and the United States auto industry as a whole. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman for his uh, statement. Um, we will now uh, introduce our first panel. Um, we first have Mr. Jeremy Anwell, who is CEO of Edmonds.com. Uh, we also have Dr. Marla Lewis, Senior Fellow at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Mr. Roland Wong is the Transportation Program Director at the Natural Resources Defense Council. And finally, Mr. Scott Greenearth is an independent trucker from 
the 4th District of Ohio. So we appreciate all of you uh, being here today. Uh, pursuant to the rules, uh, all witnesses are to be sworn in before they testify. So if you will uh, please stand up and raise your right hands. and just Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So just let the record show that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. And uh, thank you. We will uh, go now to our first uh, witness, Mr. Animal. Thank you, Chairman Jordan and Ranking Member Cummings and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today on this most important issue. I have been tracking the progress of the soon-to-be-proposed CAFE standards with a growing level of concern. This concern relates to several areas, but my comments this morning will focus on one in particular. This is one we at Edmonds think about every day, and that is the automotive consumer. I have three points to make this morning. The first is that up until now, consumers have been either ignored or misrepresented. The second is that consumers matter, and the third is that consumers are most definitely not on board. The evidence that consumers have been ignored is everywhere, but one of the clearest is this interim technical assessment prepared by EPA that listed the CAFE stakeholders. These included environmental groups, auto firms, labor unions, and others. Even EV charging firms were seen as needing a seat at the table, but apparently not consumers. Consumers matter because responding to their needs is what drives innovation, and innovation is what should drive our economy. They matter because at the end of the day, they are the ones who will be asked to buy and to drive the vehicles our government is potentially demanding car companies build. Most importantly, let me emphasize the consumer is not on board with the proposed standards. Now, I know there has been a blizzard of polls showing consumers want higher mileage standards. My contention is these polls are worse than meaningless. They are, in fact, grossly misleading. Instead of polls, we should first and foremost be guided by what consumers are actually doing, by actual purchases. In the U.S. market, consumers have demonstrated a marked preference for larger vehicles, illustrated by sales as recently as just last month. And a particular caution exists around the new high-tech, higher-mileage vehicles that have been introduced. These are the very vehicles that the administration seems determined to mandate through the proposed CAFE standards. In these instances, it is not the car company that is not getting it. They are delivering the goods. It is the consumer that is not interested. And in several cases, these cars are selling slowly, even after large tax credits have been offered. Any study of actual sales makes clear that for the vast majority of consumers, fuel economy is simply not their primary motivating factor when purchasing a vehicle. This doesn't mean they don't care about fuel economy, just that other things are more important. Consumers decide which vehicle to buy based on a weighing of vehicle features and a judgment on which set of features best meet their needs. In other words, they make tradeoffs. Price and fuel economy for most consumers represent costs. Passenger capacity, cargo space, towing ability, and other things represent features. Consumers are always happy to pay less or save fuel, but not if it means giving up features they deem important. This is key. Edmonds can actually add a special clarity around this issue of consumer preferences and demand, because among our many data sets, we have a market simulation model that was developed working with leading academics. This simulator can be used to show how consumers weight various vehicle attributes in terms of importance. And I have actually run an analysis for this committee, and the following are the results. Note that for vehicle, that vehicle mileage accounts for only about 6 percent of why consumers purchased a particular vehicle. As you would expect, the weighting does vary amongst vehicle categories. But it is important to note that even in the heavily cost-sensitive segment of subcompacts, mileage only accounts for about 15 percent of the purchase decision. There is an obvious factor that can influence these weightings, and that is the price of fuel. We have seen that when fuel prices jump, there is an increase in the number of consumers who consider smaller vehicles and in some cases buy them. But these effects are not as dramatic as I have seen claimed. Further, they have been short-lived as consumers have shifted back to larger vehicles quickly, either because they grew accustomed to the higher price, fuel prices dropped, or maybe a little bit of both. Looking at the data, there is an argument that could be made that if fuel prices increase sufficiently, market demand could align with future CAFE standards. And this is an interesting point. But the increase, about a doubling of today's price, would need to be far higher than even the most extreme forecast deem likely. And we should also consider the chance that fuel prices in the midterm could actually be lower than prices seen today. 
I do have some good news. If we look back, the auto industry seems to have delivered the impossible. They have added features, increased safety, elevated performance, and delivered increased fuel economy, much of this even during a period when CAFE standards were stable. I credit mostly the advance of technology and expect this progress to continue. But if mandates trigger an escalation of prices, a reduction in consumer utility, or the adoption of technologies before they have been proven, consumers will react. This reaction could destabilize an industry that is a vital engine of our collective prosperity. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Anwal. Dr. Lewis. Um, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Cummings, thank you for uh, inviting me to testify. Whoops. Thank you for inviting me to testify today. I know of no oversight proceeding more important than Committee Chairman Ice's investigation of the administration's actions to regulate greenhouse gases and fuel economy. Only last year, Congress declined to give EPA explicit authority to regulate greenhouse gases when Senate leaders abandoned cap-and-trade legislation. Recall that a key selling point for the Waxman-Markey cap-and-trade bill was its broad preemption of EPA regulation of greenhouse gases through the Clean Air Act. A bill introduced in 2009 authorizing EPA to do exactly what it is doing now, regulate greenhouse gases through the Clean Air Act as it sees fit, would have been dead on arrival. Therefore, the notion that Congress gave EPA such expansive authority in 1970, almost two decades before global warming became a public concern, and five years before Congress enacted its first fuel economy statute, defies common sense. In his September 30th letter to Administrator Jackson, Chairman Issa says that he finds EPA's actions troubling and inconsistent with the system of government articulated in the U.S. Constitution. I think he means the following. The Constitution seeks to ensure a system of democratic accountability through the separation of powers. The Constitution is vitiated when agencies legislate, when they exercise powers not delegated by Congress, when they flout procedural safeguards Congress has put in place. To obtain industry buy-in for its new career as fuel economy regulator, EPA pursued what might be called a regulatory extortion strategy. By reconsidering California's request for a waiver to establish its own greenhouse gas motor vehicle emissions program, EPA threatened to allow state governments to balkanize the U.S. auto market. This flouted the Energy Policy Conservation Act's express prohibition against state laws or regulations related to fuel economy. Then, in negotiations culminating in, May, in the May 2009 historic agreement, EPA offered to remove the threat of a regulatory patchwork if automakers promised not to oppose EPA and California's new non-congressionally authorized roles as national fuel economy regulators. The negotiations, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, were conducted under a vow of silence and no notes were taken, an apparent violation of the Presidential Records Act. Similarly, <clears throat> the, no the, the negotiations culminating in this year's historic agreement to raise fuel economy standards appear to violate Federal Advisory Committee Act standards of tr transparency and accountability. As Chairman Issa also notes, the fuel econ economy targets in this year's historic agreement are, quote, outside the scope of law, unquote. NHTSA and California plan to set fuel economy standards for model years 2017 to 2025, a nine-year period, but EPCA limits setting fuel economy standards to, quote, not more than five model years. The nine-year plan <clears throat> also conflicts with the EPCA requirement that NHTSA consider economic practicability when setting fuel economy standards. As Chairman Issa has explained, at the present time, it is impossible for NHTSA to adequately consider economic practicability uh, for fuel economy standards in model years 2022 to 2025 because car manufacturers themselves do not have product plans for those years. The agencies claim that EPA and California's greenhouse gas emission standards are harmonized and consistent with NHTSA's fuel economy standards, 
but EPA standards do not allow automakers to pay fines in lieu of compliance or earn credits for producing flexible fuel vehicles during model years 2016 to 2019. This means automakers face more stringent requirements than they would if fuel economy were administered under the statutory scheme Congress created. Fuel economy advocates may see no problem in the transfer of power from NHTSA to EPA and California because it produces policy outcomes they want. They forget an elementary civics lesson. The legislative process is more valuable than any result an administrative agency can, can obtain by doing an end run around it. And I think members of Congress should understand this better than anyone else. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Mr. Wong. Thank you, Chairman Jordan, Jordan and Ranking Member Cummings for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Roland Wong, and I am the Transportation Program Director for the Natural Resources Defense Council. NRDC is a nonprofit organization of scientists, lawyers, and environmental specialists dedicated to protecting public health and the environment. Founded in 1970, NRDC has more than 1.3 million members and online activists nationwide. President Obama's July 30th announcement of the latest Clean Car Agreement builds on two other previous highly successful and broadly supported agreements for stronger pollution and fuel efficiency standards for passenger vehicles and commercial trucks. These three agreements exemplify how leadership, partnership, and compromise can solve the enormous environmental, economic, and energy challenges facing this country. Far from running on empty, these clean car and fuel efficiency standards will save Americans from emptying their wallets at the pump, slow the emptying of our national wealth for foreign oil, and cut the dangerous carbon pollution that is emptying our children's future. Over the lifetime of model year 2012-2025 vehicles covered by the first and second round of clean car standards, drivers will save $1.7 trillion in fuel savings, oil dependence will be reduced by 12 billion barrels of oil, and heat trapping pollution that drives global warming will be cut by approximately 6 billion metric tons. By cutting our oil dependency, the national program will act as a powerful economic stimulus by allowing us to keep $100 billion annually by 2030 in the U.S. economy, money that otherwise would be sent overseas to Saudi Arabia, Iran, Venezuela, and other ex oil exporting countries. Drivers will have more money in their pockets. By 2030, net fuel savings from these combined standards will be equivalent to a $330 tax rebate for every American household. This higher level investment in the U.S. economy and reduced fuel bills is estimated to create 500,000 more jobs by 2030. With such overwhelming benefits, it's not surprising the most recent clean car agreement has strong support from a broad array of stakeholders, from automakers to environmentalists, Republicans to Democrats, consumer advocates to energy security advocates, business leaders to labor unions. Even an overwhelming 80 percent of small businesses owners support a 60 MPG standard by 2025. One of the great success stories is the role the national program has played in laying the foundations for the auto industry's remarkable recovery. In a world of volatile but steadily rising oil prices, it is regulation that has played a crucial role in providing businesses the certainty they need to invest in fuel-efficient technologies needed to be competitive in the future. Compared to 2009 when the, oil, when the auto industry hit rock bottom, car sales, profits, and fuel efficiency are all on the rise. And one of the key reasons for why stronger standards in the auto industry recovery are going hand in hand is that with $3.50 gallon gasoline prices, consumers are demanding, make no mistake about it, fuel efficient cars. And in fact, thanks to the new products now on the market, in anticipation of stronger standards, automakers like General Motors and Ford find themselves stepping up production and hiring new workers to keep up with the demand for fuel-efficient cars like the Chevy Cruze and Ford Focus. The market trend towards fuel efficiency is clear. Americans have fallen out of love with gas, guzzler, uh, gas guzz, uh, guzzling vehicles and engines. Where once truck-based SUVs and V8s ruled the road, now one out of every two vehicles sold is a small car small crossover or a mid-sized car. 
and thrifty four-cylinder engines are now America's most popular engine choice. Even pickup drivers are choosing fuel efficiency. Six out of ten Ford F-150 buyers are now choosing the more powerful and more fuel-efficient EcoBoost engine options, even though it costs extra. But perhaps the most remarkable result of the newest clean car agreement is what it shows about getting beyond political gridlock in today's America. The president of the auto companies states labor and environmentalists have once again shown what it means to govern effectively and what can be accomplished by constructive compromise. Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the subcommittee, the Clean Car and Clean Truck National Program are examples of government at its best. The results speak for themselves. Upsetting this important program would only raise drivers' fuel bills, increase dangerous pollution, and make us more dependent on foreign oil. In, in view of its overwhelming benefits and overwhelming support, if anything, Congress should be urging the agencies to implement this important program sooner rather than later. Thank you for your attention, and I welcome your questions. Thank you, Mr. Wong. Mr. Greener, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me here to testify. My name is Scott Greenearth. I've been a professional truck driver for more than 10 years, and I'm a prou and proud to hail from Chairman Jordan's home district. I'm here on behalf of the Owner-Operator Independent Drivers Association. OIDA's approximately 150,000 members are small business professional truckers in all 50 states. I'm here to talk about the, how the EPA and NHTSA heavy truck duty greenhouse gas and fuel efficiency rule will impact small trucking operations such as mine, particularly during a time when most small business truckers are fighting to stay afloat. While trucking is my career, environmental stewardship is my life's passion. Before trucking, I worked for many years in environmental education. My wife and I were married on Earth Day in 1995, and we both took the name Green Earth to mark our commitment to the planet. So you might assume that I support the heavy-duty truck rule. However, I'm strongly opposed to this one-size-fits-all regulation and the mandates it places on trucking. Compared to large trucking companies, small business truckers and owner-operators have a very different reality when it comes to fuel efficiency. Simply put, with diesel at close to $4 a gallon, if I do not drive in a fuel-efficient manner, I will be driving myself out of business. Considering that small businesses are the vast majority of trucking companies, it's hard to understand why the agencies chose not to tap into the collective knowledge of truckers like me on how to improve fuel efficiency. They did not speak to a single truck driver, apparently taking the attitude that truck drivers will never improve fuel economy without regulation. This view was eagerly supported by large motor carriers who all too often do turn to the government to diminish competition from smaller carriers. The resulting rule mandates add-ons and truck specifications that work for large motor carrier operations, even though trucking has hundreds of thousands of different operating models. Despite EPA's claims, this will add new costs to small business truckers, negatively impacting operations, and could lead to reduced efficiency for some. For example, a colleague hauls fresh produce in a refrigerated box trailer for most of the year, but for a few months he pulls a flatbed trailer. His tractor has a roof fairing that improves fuel efficiency while he is hauling produce. When he is not using his box trailer, he removes the fairing because it actually decreases fuel efficiency with his flatbed operation. Under this new rule, removing the fairing and improving fuel efficiency this way will be a violation of federal law. Truckers spec their trucks from bumper to bumper, making sure that everything meets the needs of their business. However, truck manufacturers have stated that this rule will reduce options to truckers. This puts us in a tough position, buy the wrong truck for my operation or buy the right truck and pay a $37,000 EPA penalty. Truckers are also forced to purchase equipment they don't need or want under this rule. Take heavy haul operations that move loads like army tanks and massive construction equipment. There's no way the aerodynamics of their truck will improve efficiency, but they will be forced to pay for mandated add-ons anyway. Low rolling resistance tires, which reduce traction, are also a significant part of this rule. Am I expected to only drive on dry and clear roads? EPA estimates all this will add another $6,000 to the price of a truck. This on top of the twenty dollars to $30,000 their previous engine emissions rules added. And that is the crazy thing about this new rule. EPA sees truckers as the reason fuel economy is down, but in reality they should look at themselves. The technology required under the former rules 
has significantly reduced fuel economy, forcing truckers to buy around 800 gallons more fuel every year. Think about how much more oil has to be refined directly because of EPA emission standards mandate. These past rules cost truckers in other ways. New trucks break down more often, costing drivers more money. Further, OIDA has learned that truck manufacturers are charging big dollars for once low-cost warranties and instituting EPA surcharges that add another $20,000 to the price of a truck. Instead of a costly one-size-fits-all rule, EPA and NHTSA could have offered a compliance alternative focused on improved driver training to operate any truck one driver drives as efficiently as possible. Yet they ignored that significant recommendation from the National Academy of Sciences in lieu of a rule that unquestionably will fail to achieve purported goals. Chairman Jordan and members of the subcommittee, OIDA supports improved efficiency and lower emissions, but there must be recognition of the cost they entail and the fact that trucking is a diverse industry. Small business truckers are inherently focused on maximizing fuel efficiency because our business success depends upon it. Pure economics tells you that trucking is going to take advantage of every opportunity to improve fuel efficiency based on their operating needs and without government mandates. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and I welcome your questions. Thank you, Mr. Greener. We appreciate all the, the, the witness and uh, their testimony. We're going to start with the gentleman who understands this issue um, or, or, excuse me, has to deal with this issue on a regular basis, and that's the gentleman from Pennsylvania who is a small business owner in the car business. Uh, gentleman, Mr. Kelly from Pennsylvania is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Amwell, uh, thanks for being here today. And as the Chairman uh, said, I think one of the other costs uh, that we are not looking at is what it costs a dealer to stock these vehicles. I am a Chevrolet dealer and have been since when well, my dad started in '53. We have a Chevy Volt on the lot right now. It has been there now for four weeks. We have had one person come in to look at it just to see what it actually looked like. Now, my question, and I, and I guess what, what I am trying to understand is here is a car that costs $45,763. I can stock that car for probably a year and then have to sell it at some ridiculous price. Now, by the way, I just got a, 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 some information from Chevrolet. In addition to the $7,500 tax credit, Pennsylvania is going to throw another $3,500 to anybody foolish enough to buy one of these cars, somehow giving $11,000 of taxpayer money to buy this Volt. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at this, it makes absolutely no sense. I can, I can stock a Chevy Cruze, which is about a 17.5 car, and turns every 30 to 40 days out of inventory. Or I can have a Volt, which never turns, and creates nothing for me on the lot except interest cost. And I'm trying to understand how in the world we come up with these ideas that somehow, somehow, if we just go electric, we're going to save all this money and all this fuel, and we're going to relieve the world of all this emission that's out there. It, it, it's absolutely insane that we continue down this path. When I, a Chevy Cruze, a Chevy Cruze can get 36 miles per gallon on the highway. Now they say on a on a on a Volt you can get 40, 94 miles per gallon. That's if you go on electric charge, right? Which I think the range on that. What is it that? Uh, we're looking at. I, I think you can go. Um, you, you can go 35 miles 35 if you just go electric. Okay, which doesn't make sense for people who live in Northwest Pennsylvania. Sometimes that's the one way just to your work. So a lot of these things that we're seeing and that are going on have a tremendous economic impact on the people who are being asked to stock them and sell them. There is no market for this car. Uh, I have had some friends who have sold them, and they're mostly to people who have a, an academic interest in it or municipalities that they are asking to buy these cars. So just from your standpoint, because you talk to a lot of dealers, people like me, sure. is there any upside to any of this? We can get cars that I can turn every 35 to 40 days that get almost the same amount of, of miles per gallon. They're, they're, they're working on their, 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 their emissions are clean. Please tell me, what is the marketing strategy on this? And I saw where, where Mr. Ackerson said we need to build 200,000 of these. I'll tell you what. If he builds 200000 he's going to have to find somebody that can buy those cars and put them on their lot. Uh, you know, but just, if, if General Motors wants to ship them to me and not put them on my floor plan, I'll, I'll gladly store them in the back lot for them, as long as I don't have any economic interest in it. But if you can tell me, where do you see this going? I mean, is anybody out there other than somebody that's good with a laptop but lousy on a countertop could tell me where in the heck are we going with this policy and where does this lead down the road? If we continue this policy, we've absolutely, 
we're, we're just, we, it makes no sense. And I can tell you, as far as job creation, the guy who ordered that bolt in my store is no longer in that job. So it actually worked against him. And I'm trying to understand, and I was told that the reason that that, that car is on our lot is that General Motors told me how to stock it. And I said, wait, let me understand. I told you under no circumstances were you to order a, uh, a Volt. And he said, well, yeah. And I said, so why did you order? He said, well, General Motors told me. I said, this is the same General Motors that tried to take my Cadillac franchise from me. Th these are the people you're listening to. The guy that signs your check doesn't have as much influence as the guy who tried to take the franchise. So if you could, I mean, t tell me, where is this market going? Do you see any market for this car at all? Well, there is a little bit of good news. You mentioned it did create some traffic for you, albeit one person. Yeah. But that is something that the car companies tout, is that these, these vehicles do attract some interest, some traffic, uh, not necessarily buyers. I think there's a couple things in, in what you're mentioning. And let me, let me also mention that the, the Volt is actually a, a very nice vehicle. We've bought one ourselves. It's in a long-term fleet. We've got an extended charger. You know, people actually enjoy it. But the problem uh, that you've, I think you've uh, outlined is really twofold. Uh, one of them is that there are all, all sorts of inducements for people to be buying these vehicles. In California, it varies. I think it's $2,500 and plus the $7,500. And yet, when you look at who's buying these vehicles, and there are people buying them, they are at the very high end of the demographic scale. Mm -hmm. And there are, there's a group in, in society, a group in the marketplace, who are very passionate about alternatively powered vehicles, Leafs, Volts. We have a, an, a, 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 our environmental editor who bought a leaf with his own money and he's putting solar panels on his roof so that he can actually charge the vehicle from the sun. And so this is, this is a little extreme, but there are people that are very passionate about that. And for these people, I think the Volt is a perfectly fine choice and so is the, the leaf is a perfectly fine choice. The, the question is, though, how many people are there like that? And right now we're seeing people who would have bought that vehicle anyway, even without the tax credits, getting the tax credit, obviously, at the expense of of other taxpayers, and you have to wonder about the wisdom of that. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm just talking people who actually have to work within a budget that they're very limited to, and part of it is not only their housing costs and their food costs, but also their, their transportation costs and the cost for fuel. It makes absolutely no sense to those people. I'm talking about hardworking, yeah. taxpaying American public that actually needs transportation to get back and forth to work. These are the people that cannot afford to buy these cars, and, and it, it makes no sense to me. It's not a marketing uh, a, a vehicle that I would want on my car lot in northwest Pennsylvania. Thanks for weighing in on it. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Recognize next, Mr. Uh, oh, I'm excuse me. Okay, we're going to go this way? All right. The gentlelady from California is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, um, to Mr. Kelly, send that Volt to California. It doesn't have to stay on your um, lot because there is a waiting list in my district at my Chevrolet dealership of six months. Will the, the, the gentle lady yield? Give uh, me the name of the dealer. I'll get it out there as quick as I can. Uh, Putnam Chevrolet. Put Send Putnam it to Chevrolet. him today, and I can guarantee if, you. If you'll pick up the transportation cost, I'd love to do that. All right. Um, Bipartisan operation. Thank you. Appreciate your help. That's, we do work together. Thank you. I'll be right back. I'm going to call the store. Mr. Chairman, um, you know, I respect your authority as chairman of this committee. Um, I realize that you can set the agenda. But this subcommittee has the responsibility to look at a number of things. Probably the most important is government spending. And if we spent our entire legislative agenda in this subcommittee on getting rid of wasteful government spending and look exclusively at the 30 to $60 billion of contracting that goes on that is fraudulent, we would be doing a service to the public. But this hearing, with all due respect, is a bad fairy tale because it doesn't reflect reality. And to you, Mr. Anwell, you said under oath that the public is, or the consumer is not on board with higher mileage vehicles. I don't know what consumer in this country wouldn't be interested in getting a vehicle that gets better mileage because they save money at the gas pump if they get a vehicle that gets better mileage. Now, I want to address to you the press release put out by Ford Motor Company on June, in June of 2011, just a couple of months ago, entitled, Miles Per Gallon Matters. 42% say fuel economy is key in new vehicle purchase decisions. Influence likely to grow, unquote. The release cited the new vehicle customer study done by Moritz Research that's been going on since the 1970s. 
And according to this study, 42% of those surveyed say fuel economy is, and I quote, extremely, not a little, extremely important in their decision to purchase a new 2011 model. And it's been a 13% increase versus 10 years ago. So for you to say that it is the consumer is not on board is a false statement. And I want you to address the Ford Motor Company press release that says 42% say it's extremely important in their new car decision. Thank you. So let me explain. And I did say that under, under oath, and I do stand by that statement. The issue that we're dealing with is that what you're citing are, are surveys, and there are a lot of surveys out there that show that consumers, and the numbers are going to vary, but that basically they're making the case that to consumers, fuel economy is very important. The issue that you run into, though, either through the survey design or pretty much on any survey, that surveys are going to create some strange results. The big one is that consumers uh, tend to respond to surveys in ways that they think are societally acceptable. And a great example of this would be when you ask someone, why did you pick the job that you've got? They're going to talk about job satisfaction or making a difference, and yet when you actually do a mathematical scientific study, you're going to find that they took the job because of the money, and yet nobody says that on a survey. And we're seeing the same thing in terms of the cars that people are buying. So when I say that they're not on board, it's not that they don't say nice things in surveys. What matters are the vehicles that they are buying, and their preference is overwhelmingly not for the types of vehicles that are being mandated by this proposed set of, of regulations. So you're basically saying that people don't say what they mean. A absolutely. So then why do we listen to any polls? That is a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would echo that. <laughs> but, but, but Mr. Anwell, you cited your own polls. So it, it sounds like well, you're, no, no. you're being not selective. No, the study that we've done is actually a market-based study where we look at the vehicles that people are buying and we blend into that consumer analysis, but it's fundamentally dri dr driven by the vehicles that they are choosing in the marketplace, not what they're saying when somebody calls them up at dinner time. All right, Mr. Wang, how would you respond to that? Well, first of all, I think this discussion about the Chevy Volt is a, a good discussion to have, and I think we would like more Chevy Volts in California. Um, however, the, the fact of the matter is the 54.5 MPG standard will not require vehicles like the Chevy Volt. Uh, General Motors is free to build such vehicles, uh, but the reaching 54.5 MPG can be done with rather conventional technologies. Furthermore, Mr. Anwell does point out a very important issue, which is that we should listen to the market. L so let's look at the marketplace. Um, in September, uh, what we have seen is an increase in so-called crossover utility vehicles. Okay, these are not SUVs. I think, believe in his testimony, he um, uh, uh, labeled these as SUVs. Uh, true truck-based SUV market is uh, no longer exists, practically no longer exists. It's been cut in half since 2005. These are the Chevy Tahoes and what you traditionally might think of as, as a Ford Explorer. And in fact, in September, a very popular vehicle, very popular Chevy vehicle that drove General Motors sale growth is a, a vehicle, a crossover utility vehicle, a car-based, very tall station wagon type vehicle called the Chevy Equinox. The Chevy Equinox, the most fuel efficient version you can buy, which many customers are choosing, achieves 25.9 miles per gallon for a crossover utility vehicle that replaces the Chevy Trailblazer. And the Chevy Trailblazer used to achieve, the General, General Motors no longer builds it, 17.2 miles per gallon combined cycle. So therefore, customers are speaking. They are buying fuel-efficient vehicles, whether they're crossover utility vehicles, whether they're compact cars, or whether they're other types of vehicles. A recent article by Edmonds, October 6, on Edmonds' uh, site, talked about pickup trucks. Pickup truck sales did increase in September, but the, I quote, the title of the article was, Incentives Bulge to Keep Big Pickups Moving. So it's not like the Ameri American public is flocking back to big gas guzzling vehicles. One, to cross over utility vehicles, not SUVs. And two, incentives, according to Edmonds, averaged um, uh, for pickup trucks, in, uh, the current incentive level is $4,281 up from in April of 3,261, a quote from Edmonds, appears market share, perhaps profitable, perhaps not, was bought largely with increased incentives. Again, this is the pickup market. 
thank you. Uh, before recognizing the gentleman from New York, let me just just be just be clear, Mr. Anwell. So you're saying your poll is based on actual purchases versus what people may say? Is that, is that correct? Uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, it's actually not a poll. This is a scientific study. Yeah, yes. Right. The, yeah. the facts are the fact. Very different. Uh, let me ask one one quick one, one quick other. If if let's assume Ms. Spire is right that that in fact Americans want higher miles per gallon, then then I I, I go to the fundamental question. Why do we need government to impose it? If that's what they want, won't the market get us there? Well, I think the three pillars under which I have heard supporters talk about the new CAFE standards, one of them is that the technology is readily available, the second is that it is cheap, and the third is that the consumers want it. And I think to your point, in a free market economy, you wouldn't need regulation to drive sales. Under those circumstances, the market would be pulling sales through for you. Yep, exactly right. Thank you. Now I recognize the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Perkle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to our panelists for being here today. Unfortunately, the gentlelady from California left. I just have a couple of issues with what she said. First of all, she mentioned we should be dealing with wasteful government spending. And I think when, when we see $7,500 tax credits to, to a car that is questionable in the market and, and trying to, to put the government in the middle of how the market works, I think that's a waste of taxpayer money. Um, I also want to mention about Ford and the press. I would, was going to ask her to repeat the press release that she read regarding Ford. Ford has a vested interest in this. And speaking of wasteful government spending, the amount of money they receive from this administration, both in grant and in loans, is several billions of dollars. And so I think when they issue a press release such as that, there is they have a vested interest in this whole initiative going forward. And that's precisely what we're doing here this morning. We're, we're trying to understand why a regulatory agent agency is circumventing the legislative process. And, and so we all are concerned with wasteful government spending, but I think we need to be clear about, uh, about that. Uh, I wanted to talk to uh, Mr. Anwell. I have a, a couple questions for you. Um, NRDC cites a survey, and Mr. Wang mentioned at the small business majority that says the majority of small businesses support fuel economy standards. Um, the whole project, frankly, seems fundamentally ideological and clearly liberal. That's what was uh, stated in the Demo uh, within the Democratic Party. The small business majority has all the hallmarks of a shadowy interest group, starting with uh, a name. Are you familiar with this survey, the, the small business majority? I've seen an over excuse me yes I've seen an overview of the study yes and how do you how does that reconcile with what your studies have shown well I think this echoes what I was talking about earlier this is actually a poll so it's not a scientific study I think as I was saying the the poll respondents tend to say what they think is societally acceptable you find that with every poll uh, the third thing on this particular study is it seems when you look at how the questions were phrased that the results were somewhat inevitable I mean I can read I can read you the, uh, the, que the one question. This is on the pro-regulation side. Yes, if you would clarify that, that would be great. Sure. So l listen to the question. It says, should automakers be required to meet higher fuel efficiency standards because of our growing dependence on Middle East oil is a, th is a serious threat to our national security and American car companies lost market share in this country be because they built fuel inefficient vehicles? From a polling perspective, that is uh, what I would call a highly leading question. There is almost no way to respond to that other than with the, uh, in the affirmative. So as you would expect, that's what the poll did. It showed that consumer, that uh, small businesses favor higher standards. Now, in your testimony, you mentioned uh, that the consumers were left out, that they weren't consulted. Can you just expand on that? Well, I think we've heard this morning that uh, the new standards were arrived at through a process where secrecy was a requirement. And from the consumer perspective, we were looking at this all along and were very troubled by that process. Uh, my personal belief is that government should be transparent, that things should be simple and should be easy to understand. When we contacted the EPA about the consumer point of view, their uh, response was that consumers would have the ability to contribute during the hearing process, during the, um, after the rules had been published, there is a process where consumers can comment. I wonder how much consumer comments will be actually taken into consideration when a deal has already been announced. So that your position or your, your thought is that this period of time for comment isn't going to cure the defect in this whole process? I would find that unlikely. Dr. Lewis, would you like to expand on that? <clears throat> well, yes, there is a, there's a basic difference between um, 
the opinions that people express just in response to a question and um, the revealed preferences that they have when they are actually putting their money where their mouth is. And so I think that is what um, my colleagues here uh, study actually tries to measure, is revealed preference. Uh, another, another point to consider would be, um, and, and I completely acknowledge that a lot of people really do want to buy more fuel efficient cars, and um, I trust the data that, that Mr. Huang uh, was uh, mentioning about how many people are now buying you know, V6s rather than V8s and so on. But if that is what people really want, why do we need a law forcing automakers to produce those cars? If the automakers don't provide customer satisfaction and if the dealers, Mr. Kelly, uh, don't have cars on the lot that people want to buy, they will be penalized in the marketplace more ruthlessly than any government regulator could possibly uh, uh, administer. And so it seems to me that the only purpose that a fuel economy standard would serve would be to actually limit um, what customers are able to buy and what automakers are able to sell and produce. I mean, that is the only point of them, really. Uh, because if we just had a totally free market, then uh, automakers would be able to, to cater to consumer preferences rather than government agency directives. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. My time is up, but I just want one, one further comment, if I may, Mr. Chairman. In all of this, you know, everyone wants to drive a fuel-efficient car, but I had six children. My son has seven children. So some of these options, it isn't that I don't want to drive a, a fuel-efficient car. It's that the reality is I've got to fit these kids in a car, and I want my kids to be safe. Thank I you. yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I think, gentlemen. Real quickly, Mr. Greenearth, as, as a small business owner who has the standards already imposed on your trucking company, did you feel your <coughs> concerns were addressed during the comment time that, that you had? I and mean, when we're talking about the comment period that exists for people to weigh in, consumers and business owners, how was it for you? I know that, <clears throat> excuse me, I know the staff from OIDA is more than happy to get a hold of me anytime. They know I'll show up in D.C. anytime there's a worthwhile in, uh, opportunity for input. They tried to contact, get the EPA to uh, provide an opportunity for actual truck drivers to have input. Nothing. They yeah. did not get back to them. That, that is one of the things that drives me nuts. So you would agree with the statement that Mr. Lewis and Mr. Anwell made that, that it seems to be the deal's already done? Yeah, that generally seems to sum it up there, definitely. Okay. It's, it, it's very disheartening, to put it mildly. I, th I thank the gentleman. Now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from Maryland. Thank you very much. As I um, listen to all of this, I'm, you know, I'm wondering what the Mr. Wang, is it Wang? You know, what's, let's assume for a moment that uh, all that Mr. Anvil is saying is true and Dr. Lewis. I'm trying to figure out what's the downside of trying to save fuel. You know, I'm just trying, maybe I'm missing something. You know, you, you talked about how we're sending dollars overseas and how we, it would be good to, uh, for our consumers, our constituents to spend less money uh, on gasoline. But, I mean, you've listened to Mr. Anvil and he's talked about what consumers are, are doing. I mean, but what's the downside of trying to do this? Maybe I'm missing something. Uh, frankly, Mr. Cummings, I uh, strongly concur with you. I, I struggle to see downsides in uh, this new proposal. Uh, the benefits to the consumer, uh, the benefits to our uh, balance of trade and reducing imported oil, uh, the benefits to the environment are overwhelming. Uh, why is there a law or a requirement for, for uh, automakers to raise fuel economy and lower CO2? Well, the fact of the matter is that there is a national interest here at stake, our energy dependency and the future of our health and our environment. And so there is a national interest here at stake. So I think it is quite appropriate that, the, uh, that there are long-term standards. Uh, furthermore, of course, what we have seen over the past history of the U.S. auto industry and the, the, what, we, what we've seen, the combativeness associated with the last two decades of trying to lower carbon pollution and raise fuel economy for motor vehicles has not actually done a great service, actually has done a disservice 
to the U.S. auto industry, who was caught multiple times um, when oil prices were raised and lost market share. Jobs were lost. Uh, companies uh, 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 lost market share, especially the domestic automakers. So no one really wants to return to the bad old days of fighting about new standards because everybody recognizes that it is in our long-term interest, both from a business perspective, from the U.S. auto industry, and from a national interest perspective, to reduce our dependency on oil and enhance U.S. economic competitiveness by having the U.S. auto industry build the cars of the future. And Ms. Burkle, as a just, just as a, I, I'm a father of two, two children, uh, safety is an absolutely critical importance uh, to myself personally. And I would say that um, uh, to your um, question about uh, like needing to haul around your family, uh, needing a larger vehicle, um, it, when it comes to safety, design matters. Vehicles who, which, which are lighter can be safe or safer than heavier vehicles. This is data that I'm happy to submit. Some of it is in my testimony. And, and furthermore, I also mentioned that there is a vehicle called the Chevy Equinox. Um, the Chevy Equinox is a crosser utility vehicle. It holds um, uh, you know, probably at least, um, I'll have to check on that, but it's a mid-sized cr uh, a crosser utility vehicle. That vehicle <laughs> achieves 25.9 miles per gallon, 50 percent higher than the 17.2 miles per gallon vehicle that the Chevy that, that Chevy replaced, called the Chevy Trailblazer. Let me let me just interrupt because I want to ask you one more question. Um, you know, I, I you talk about your kids. I teach my kids never mistake a comma for a period. And I think we could go the route we've been going and be the same place we are 20 years from now. At some point, you know, I think we have to aim in the direction that we're aiming in. And let's assume what Mr. Anvil says is true, that maybe people are not buying the, these vehicles as fast. I'm just assuming for the moment. You know, maybe there's some people that need to catch up with that. I mean, at some point, I can tell you people in my area, uh, they need that extra savings because a lot of them have lost their jobs, lost their houses. And so if there's any way that they can save fuel, they want to do that. And I'm just, I'm just, when we talk about innovation, sometimes I think we need to be aiming at a higher standard. We're better than this. And when I go to other countries, I mean, it seems like I see these cars uh, everywhere. And I don't know whether, how do we compare to other countries with regard to this kind of issue? Well, the fact of the matter, when it comes to international competitiveness, we have, have slipped behind, and we are behind uh, Europe um, and even China when it comes to current fuel economy levels. Uh, both Europe and China are moving forward very aggressively with advanced vehicles also, including electric vehicles. So the world is moving in a more fuel efficient, uh, moving, world is moving towards uh, hybrid electric vehicles, battery electric vehicles, plug-in electric vehicles, and, and that's really the future. And that's where we really where we need to in invest our money in our U.S. manufacturing innovation and competitiveness if we still want to be able to compete in the 21st century. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I would argue part of that in Europe is that the price of gasoline is about eight, eight bucks a gallon, so there's a little, little different climate there. Uh, let me just real quickly ask uh, uh, Mr. Lewis, can this, can, you know, the, the, Mr. Wong, if you listen to him, we should why not make it 70 miles per gallon, 100 miles? If it's if it's going to be all this this wonderful world, and just raise it as high as we possibly can, can we meet the standard now, the 49 miles per gallon that that NHTSA has, the 54 that EPA? Can that standard be met today? I know that's the target in the future, but can it be met? Uh, there are very few cars that could that could meet that standard today, and certainly and, not in a practical yeah. sense for right. folks who live like well, in Northwest Pennsylvania, like Mr. Kelly talked about, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, and. And if we're going to offer $7,500 in tax rebates to to put a million of these vehicles on the road, that's a seventy that's seven point five billion dollars uh, in loss of revenue at a, at a time of, of a fiscal crisis. So you wonder how affordable it is from a national perspective as well. Um, I I wish I had the uh, reference here. I will provide it to the committee. But I saw an article only a few weeks ago that said that in China, SUV sales are booming. 
that in 2010 there were 850,000 SUVs sold and only one hybrid sold, one, high, one Prius in all of China, and it may have been purchased by an engineer who was trying to take it apart to see how it worked. Um, Gentlemen, and, 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 gentlemen, I want to recognize. So, so here's here's the downside that I see. In, in quickly, because I want to recognize. Okay, well, from Idaho. the the premise of of setting fuel economy standards really is that consumers don't understand their best interest, that they uh, that that they let the 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 short term pain of a higher priced vehicle overwhelm uh, their good judgment in in achieving longer term fuel savings. But this kind of reduces the the consumer to um, a, a two-dimensional character who's the only thing that the consumer considers from this mentality is upfront costs versus right. fuel expenditures, where, whereas, in fact, we know that consumers are much more complicated than that. Sometimes yeah. you don't want to spend yeah. a couple of extra thousand dollars this year on a car because you want to send your kid to college or because you need it for the kid's music lessons. So if you read the EPA NHTSA literature, they say that consumers undervalue Fuel economy. Well, that's like saying consumers undervalue music lessons. Yeah, thank and you. where it gets Mr. really Lewis, crazy. Gonna, hang on one second. I'm going to stop. Okay. Right I'm going to get to Mr. Uh, Labrador, and, and maybe okay. you, maybe you can jump right back in there. Gentleman from Idaho is recognized. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, is it Green Earth, Grammy? Yes, Green Earth. Um, I just have a question. I don't know if you heard what Mr. Wong just said, but he said that there's really no downside to this new cafe standards, and I think I heard your testimony say something different. Can, can you? Do you agree with this statement? Oh, I definitely would say that there's a downside to it because of the fact that uh, if you just look at, for example, the you know the last time the EPA did this you know, with the 2004 and 2007 standards, fuel economy dropped with the uh, exhaust gas recirculation being introduced in trucks. It dropped by one mile per gallon. One mile per gallon on a vehicle that gets you know on a, a good average would be six miles per gallon. That's a huge downside you know that uh, uh, that's very detrimental that's put more greenhouse gas out in the air so and now the other thing that came along with that is reduced reliability and i mean in a big way those valves fail frequently and, and that is something as a matter of fact i called uh, shop in uh, back in congressman jordan's district where i get my truck worked on they said in, and this is a pretty small truck repair shop too and that week they replaced four egr valves on trucks that's four hundred dollars a piece, plus basically missing an entire day's work, and maybe even worse than that, losing a customer because you're viewed as not a reliable uh, individual anymore in your business. And so that unproven technology is a very, very serious concern. It's been proven, unfortunately, from the, these previous mandates that that does happen. We were talking about trying to push technology that's really not there, and that's why I personally can tell you that when I went to buy my truck almost exactly three years ago when I became an owner-operator, I intentionally purchased a truck that was did not have that exhaust gas recirculation on it because I believe that I can make the choice the way I drive the vehicle between here and my right foot that I know how to drive it appropriately and get the best fuel economy. I haul very heavy loads all the time. I get 7.2 miles per gallon. So what you're saying is that central government planning doesn't necessarily work. Yeah, exactly. absolutely. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to end up with proven technology. You know that there is a lot of risks in this. You know, I don't gamble. I'm willing to take a risk mm -hmm. being a small business owner, but I do not gamble. Definitely not. Mr. Anwell, uh, what's the number one uh, selling vehicle in America right now? Generally, it's the F-150 pickup truck from Ford. And it, it, that's just like a Prius, right? It gets the same <laughs> gas mileage? <laughs> it's a little bit bigger than a Prius. Okay. And uh, can you explain to us why, if America wants fuel efficiency, why the F-150 is the number one selling vehicle in America? Well, I think it actually is supported by my earlier testimony, and that is that consumers are looking for fundamental utility when they buy a vehicle. They buy a vehicle to do something, to, to take uh, their family around, to haul something, to tow something. And I think it's important to note that the car companies have been delivering utility and better performance, better safety, and improved fuel economy over the past few years, and I do expect that to continue. So when we talk about the future, what we need to be recognizing is that the future in terms of fuel economy is going to improve even without additional regulation. 
the trend line there is, is pretty clear. The F-150 is interesting because they have introduced a V6 Echo Boost engine, and I think that uh, is probably the best evidence of what I have described, because what Ford has done with the, with the Echo Boost is actually improved the utility of the truck. It has got more torque, more towing capacity, happens to get only one MPG better, so it is not like it is solving all the problems, but it is a step in the right direction. Excellent. Dr. Lewis, um, I am having a hard time here understanding why, if America wants these cars, we have to give them $7,500 to buy them. I really like Big Macs, and the government doesn't have to make me, force me to buy those Big Macs. So why, how does this work? <laughs> <laughs> well, you have just uh, provided the reductio ad absurdum, and you are absolutely correct. And what is even, I think, stranger, and this is what I was going to get to uh, earlier, is that the the EPA and NHTSA seem to think that even truck drivers, people who haul freight for a living, people whose single biggest operating expense is fuel, people who live on razor-thin profit margins don't understand their true interest, are short-sighted buyers and need to be forced to buy uh, trucks that meet, meet uh, government-imposed fuel economy regulations. And, you know, it's, it, it's, it's like saying we need a Big Mac mandate. So we're too stupid to know that we want these cars. Is that what what's being said here? I think there is a nanny statish uh, aspect to this, in which um, um, ordinary people are viewed as just big children. Mr. Chairman, I respect your job very much, and I think that if we're going to look at government spending, the fact that we're spending $7,500 for each one of these cars, and in some states we're adding another $2,000 to $2,500, I think that's wasteful government spending, especially if it's something that the people want. Well said. Thank you, gentlemen. Now I yield to the ranking member of the committee, my good friend from Cleveland, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I just want to say that I think uh, Mr. Anwell is one of the most remarkable witnesses that this committee has ever had because he came to a town that is totally reliant on polls. <laughs> right. The White House, the presidential race, the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, just about every member of Congress is reliant on polls. And we have a witness come before this committee who tells us definitively, authoritatively, no doubt, the polls are not scientific. I want everyone to mark this moment and uh, check with your campaign treasurers. <laughs> uh, uh, now, next, I, and, I, and I think that we ought to take Mr. Anwell's other comment about consumers don't care about, uh, much about fuel economy in the same, uh, with the same um, uh, humor. Now, um, I, I just want to say the trucking industry is a critical part of Ohio's economy provides Ohio with over 290,000 jobs. But in order to survive and remain competitive, truck drivers need trucks that get better gas mileage and cost less to operate. That is exactly why the new fuel efficiency standards for medium and heavy-duty trucks that were finalized this summer are so important to Ohio and the trucking industry. And it is also why there is a long list of trucking industry groups that support the new rule, including the American Trucking Association and its Ohio aff affiliate, the Ohio Trucking Association. Now, Mr. Wang, I am puzzled by Mr. Granter's testimony that members of the Owner Operator Independent Drivers Association will be harmed by the new standards. Can you discuss the impact of the proposed fuel economy standards on the trucking industry, including trucking companies that are small, locally owned businesses? What do they stand to gain or lose? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kucinich. Um, According to the EPA analysis, uh, standards, these new, this new uh, fuel economy and CO2 program for medium and heavy-duty trucks will save truck owners quite a bit of money. Uh, Semi-truck owners will save an average of $73,000 over the life of the truck. For purchasers of new trucks, fuel savings in the first year will outweigh incremental cost of $6,300. Uh, $6,200. Uh, fuel savings are estimated to be about, for most truck drivers, to be $10,000. For drivers that finance their purchase, savings will accrue immediately in the form of lower monthly payments, both for their vehicles and fuel costs. So in the first month, tr most truck owners will actually see savings. In the first year, they will see um, uh, the, the incremental costs uh, paid. Thank you, sir. I, I just want to say whatever views one holds about environmental protections, 
against greenhouse gas emissions, it would be difficult to dispute the fact that unemployment and a weak labor market are continuing to devastate the future of this country. The bottom line is that job creation benefits from the manufacturing of fuel-efficient vehicles and components will help reduce the massive unemployment rate in this country. Ohio is at the heart of the auto industry, ranking second only to Michigan in terms of employment in, motor vehicle in, in the motor vehicle industry. In Ohio, it is estimated that the higher fuel standards will create at least 23,000 new jobs. I know that in Ohio we have many more skilled workers who would jump at good jobs in the clean auto manufacturing industry. Now, we have a chart here. Do, uh, does the staff have it available? Do we have it? Well, we are going to uh, uh, now this, this chart, which uh, sorry it is not more amplified, uh, shows every member's district in this room stands to gain jobs resulting from new technologies. Now, Mr. Wang, again, can you talk in detail about the, ar the array of job opportunities, both inside and outside the auto industry, that will be created as a result of higher fuel efficiency and auto pollution standards? Yes, uh, I would be glad to. Um, in terms of job opportunities for fuel efficiency, we've we've seen what has happened to the U.S. auto industry from lack of attention to fuel efficiency. Jobs have been lost; market share has been lost. Um, conversely, we see the benefit already of the U.S. auto industry, U.S. auto supply industry, already in a joint study by the United Auto Workers (NRDC) in the National Wildlife Federation, we have uh, identified already 300 facilities in 43 states plus the District of Columbia that are currently responsible for employment of 150,000 workers today that are building components for uh, fuel efficient and clean and advanced, vehicle, uh, advanced and conventional, I would add, uh, vehicle technologies. Uh, according to a recent forecast, in 2030, the job creation potential will be 500, close to 500,000 for a 54.5 MPG standard by 2030. That's accruing both from new manufacturing jobs and the fact that there will be more money in back in the pockets of consumers, equivalent to a $330 tax rebate that they can spend back into the economy. I, I want to thank the gentleman. My time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank each of the witnesses for testifying. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. We will now yield to the chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from California, Mr. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And following up on Mr. Kucinich, uh, there is a lot of humor here. Uh, and uh, I know that, uh, Dennis, my friend, you know, you intend to find humor whenever you can. But, you know, what I find humor is that only a couple of weeks ago this committee had a hearing in which we had Secretary Hilda Solis, and we asked her about green jobs, and she was able to show that this administration, for $250 million, had managed to create 1,000 new green jobs, those being jobs that last a year or more. They created 8,000, if you don't mind the fact they only lasted as long as we paid for the training. So what I find interesting uh, in, in Mr. Huang's uh, testimony is he's talking about you know, green jobs. Well, the problem is the definition of green jobs includes a bus driver, we found out last week. Not a hybrid bus driver, not an electric bus, just any form of public transportation. So as I see this administration have a war on the private automobile and the private light truck, I kind of get it that, uh, yes, you will get green jobs, and those green jobs will be you know, forcing people off the road and out of the vehicles they want. Dr. Lewis, you know, uh, when I compare the, uh, the, the mission of the NRDC, which is to save the earth and the hell with the American people, uh, no, I'm, I'm serious. You know, sometimes you just get a witness and you look and say, I know the organization, I'm sure he's knowledgeable and so on, but I've been through this. Clearly, they could care less about whether we still have automobiles. As a matter of fact, we're mandating electric vehicles. Fine. GE bought a bunch of them as long as they got the tax break. But we're, we're doing it when we still don't have a nuclear or other alternative to the 51 percent of our fuel that's created by coal and when it comes to electric fuel. So I want to ask a couple of quick questions. Sure. When you look at the total package of subsidies and unfunded mandates that are in the current uh, CAFE increase, and when I say unfunded, the cost to industry that they are going to have in addition to the subsidies and so on, if you were to take that amount of money and set it in a pot and say, we will invest in better mileage technology at a given weight, a given performance level, what fraction of that 
hundred billion dollars a year do you think it would take if the government started looking and saying we want to be part of the solution, not simply shift costs to people so they can feel good? I happen to own a Prius. It's a wonderful vehicle. At the end of 50,000 miles, it hasn't paid for itself, and everyone knows it. What, 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 where would we be if we took that other tact instead of constantly shifting huge amounts of unfunded mandates to auto companies, some of them effectively owned or controlled by the American administration currently in the White House? Well, I, I do think that we would be more prosperous and that the auto industry would be. At, one of the figures that was cited earlier is that just to comply with the current uh, model year 2012 to 2016 standards requires an investment of $50 billion. Now, what if that money had been invested by the auto industry to, to meet revealed consumer preferences? I would imagine that some of that would have gone into fuel economy improvements, but some of it might have gone into other amenities, features, uh, capacities, maybe things we can't even imagine. Um, so I, I just... It seems to me, though, that it, a very good suspicion is that it would have, in the long term, produced more jobs, uh, more happy customers yeah. than, than the government trying to determine what it is people should want to buy. Well, uh, Mr. Greener, I'm going to follow up with you. As an environmentalist, as somebody who does care about how we get more for less strain on our environment, you mentioned you carry heavy loads. By definition, to get to 55 miles per gallon, isn't a big part of that going to be simply limiting the capacity of vehicles, dumbing down uh, categories so that your category may not be where the real savings is? The category of the vehicle you need to carry heavy load simply may be the one that they try to find a way not to sell. Isn't that really what you've seen in the past in CAFE standards? Well, there's, there's definitely with, uh, if I can show you here, like Kenworth, for example, uh, streamlined option choices. And we're talking about you know, large trucks. They're talking about to meet these standards having to eliminate some of the choices that are available. And those are things like when you get into heavy haul, people that do, I'm, I'm, I do, when I say heavy, I'm talking, I'm right at 80,000 pounds, you know, typically. Okay, Always and I'm assuming that you already go to alloy wheels, alloy tanks, uh, aerodynamic improvement, I, you, all I've the got things, things to reduce like, yep. drag and to reduce weight. But ultimately, if you're carrying a 65,000 pound cargo, that part there's no way to make it lighter, is there? Absolutely. Or, or if it's a very large object with wind, low wind resistance, you can't do that. So when we look at the standard, and we've been talking about cars and light trucks today, we look at the standards, don't we really have to look at the fuel economy achievements giving, carrying a specific load, whether that's the vehicle or, in this case, the cargo, look at the railroad industry and the improvements that they continue to make because it's all about carrying more for less? and the heavy truck industry, and haven't we found that basically that's mostly an engine design improvement to optimize efficiency, something that is not in the CAFE standards? The CAFE standards reward you for simply taking weight out, making light, tinny vehicles, not necessarily producing true efficiency increases. Isn't that what you found in the trucking industry? I found that you definitely have to spec your vehicle out for specifically what you're doing. I mean, that owner operators take great care to make sure that the wheels, the transmission, the final gear ratio, Tire pressure. everything tires exactly and maintain, all, maintain it impeccably as well, too. So absolutely, you have to, you have to do that or you're not going to succeed. It's that simple. Thank you. And, Mr. Chairman, I, I might comment for the record, because it always seems like the, uh, the press says, well, you have a vested interest in this and this. I had two RVs. My old RV, which used the uh, uh, Mercedes diesel, it's a Sprinter, Dodge Sprinter, uh, before they required that, that actual fuel economy reduction uh, design. So I've, I've experienced my old one versus my new one, and I like the new one, and I like a lot of the features. But going to a newer RV with a, a, a quote, next generation engine and getting less mileage was pretty repugnant to me and, and I think to all of us who... Would the gentleman yield? Of course, I'd leave to the I, gentleman. I, I, would just, uh, I would just like to say, well, um, uh, the chairman and I may have some fundamental disagreements about uh, where we go with these policies. I think there's probably very few members of Congress who have the kind of expertise that you do have mm -hmm. in this area. We have to, you know, we have to um, appreciate that. 
Thank you. Well, thank you. And, and I thank you for pointing out the wrong way in diesel uh, technology, because it, it is something that I think this committee w didn't watch closely enough, and hopefully we will continue to monitor it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wong, earlier you referenced uh, material uh, on safety and the idea that lighter cars are, in fact, and you had said you cited, I think, some study that shows their safety. We would like for you to provide that to the committee at the, uh, at the end of the hearing, if you if would be able to do that. I want to next uh, recognize Mr. Ginta uh, for his five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Huang, I read your testimony on page 3. You said by 2030, the 2012 to 2025, National program standards will reduce oil consumption by 3.1 million barrels per day. Can you tell me um, what expectation you have for uh, vehicle sales annually during that period of time? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the issue of uh, vehicle sales, as uh, currently uh, the estimate for this year, the sale for 2012, the sales, uh, sorry, for this year model, uh, for calendar year 2011, is 13.6 million units. Um, I, I believe in 2005, or, sorry, let me correct that. In, in 2008, uh, when the auto industry hit the rock bottom, the units were about 10 million. It's 10, 10 point something million units. Uh, so this points to the fact that vehicle sales can increase, profits can increase, as well as fuel efficiency. If you take the agency estimates as well as our estimates of what the cost of the new technology will be and what the payback time will be in 2025 for the 54.5 MPG, my full expectation is that vehicle sales will continue to increase from the 13.6 million units that we are expecting this year. And my full expectation is that these vehicles will actually be highly desirable for consumers, and because of the payback time attractiveness, that there will no, be no impact. And if there is any impact, in my opinion, it will be a positive impact, an increase in sales. Today, the vehicles on the used car market, the most valuable cars on the used car market, according to data from KBB from Edmonds and other places, and also NADA, the National Automobile Association, the most valuable vehicles on the used car market today are fuel efficient vehicles. Mm -hmm. The least valuable uh, uh, um, uh, vehicles on, uh, on the market today, used car market today, are fuel inefficient vehicles. The F 150 is a great example. Six out of ten, the new car market, six out of ten buyers are buying the F 150 Echo Boost, more fuel efficient V6 option. So consumers are willing to pay more for fuel efficiency because of the benefits that it, that, that, that it accrues. So my expectation is the sales in 2020-2025 will continue to increase from today's, and it will, um, if anything, uh, vehicle sales will be higher than otherwise. Okay. In New Hampshire, uh, where I represent, we roughly have 600 businesses that are related to the motor vehicle industry. We have about 13,000 employees. There was a chart that was put up earlier that showed uh, with these standards we would increase jobs in New Hampshire by approximately 2,600. I would love to see an increase in this industry uh, for New Hampshire by 2,600. What you are saying is, in part, the increase in sales uh, will will continue to grow as the economy comes back. But you also said something else. You said this is uh, this is based also on payback. <clears throat> I want to take just Manchester, the city that I'm from. The average uh, family income is is under somewhere between fifty five and sixty thousand dollars. If you're looking at payback and looking at uh, Chevrolet as the example, the Cruise is a twenty thousand dollar vehicle. The Volt is 45,760. That's a difference of 25,763. Here's the math that I don't quite understand. The cruise is the 1682 is what you would spend annually uh, for fuel, and the Volt is 1,000, according to the sticker. So that's a difference, a fuel savings of 682 dollars per year. My math says <clears throat> that you would have to have that car for 37 years in order to achieve payback. So if I purchased that today, I just had a birthday last month, I'm 41, I would be 78 years old by the time I had payback on that vehicle. I am struggling to see how the marketplace, the consumer, when they walk into a, to a showroom and decide that they want 
a, a vehicle with greater fuel uh, efficiency. And I agree with the statement made earlier that fuel, fuel does matter. But purchase price matters even more. So if you can find a purchase price that dictates the savings, I think the, the theory would be that more people would buy these vehicles. But you are talking right now about a, almost a $26,000 differential and a 37-year payback. So I struggle to, to appreciate or, or understand how that math would work and how the country over this period of time would, uh, would see that 37-year payback as, as something effective for their family and efficient for their family in, in cost dollar savings. Uh, well, very quickly, in 2025, today's technology is not 2025 technology, uh, for one. So, but uh, second, the calculations that we have done based upon the agency and our own cost estimates is that in the first month, drivers who finance the purchase of their vehicles will see monthly savings in their vehicle payments and fuel costs. Their costs will go down. So immediately... Uh, but how, how is that possible if the vehicle is 45000 today? for the Volt. It's $45,760. So if I, as an average shopper, what, what does the average individual spend on a car? $25,000? 33. $33,000. Okay. So just take the 33 number. You're adding, you're going up to forty five, almost $46,000. I fail to see how the, the financing would actually, monthly payment would come down. I mean, unless you're financing it over a longer period of time. Of course, the, it would come down in that perspective. I believe, sir, the difference in our uh, calculations are that, and my calculations and my estimates, based upon the agencies and, and other uh, uh, publicly available research data, uh, we believe that Chevy Volts and other kind of electric vehicles will actually not be required to, to no one will have to be required to build those kinds of vehicles to meet the 2025 standards. In fact, these 2025 standards can be met through improvement in conventional, relatively conventional gasoline vehicle technology, much less expensive. The example I gave earlier is 50 percent improvement between a Chevy Equinox and a Chevy Trailblazer, and that's from, and both of those are considered to many people as a sport utility vehicle. And in fact, the Equinox is a lighter, more fuel efficient, so-called crossover utility vehicle. 50 percent better improvement in the combined EPA estimated fuel economy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, I thank the gentleman from uh, New Hampshire. Mr. Kelly, recognized for. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I would like to ask me to put it in, in the record. I have the actual the window stickers that uh, would probably help later right. on. Testimony that right. shows actually the, the list prices and the fuel savings based on, on the calculations that is on the, the Moroni label of every vehicle. Produced, so I'd like to Super. submit that because that really adds some uh, authenticity into what we're talking about. Thank you, thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Anwell, just one, one one question for you: Why, why if um, if it's if it's not in the consumer's best interest, if it doesn't seem to be in the best interest of the market, why uh, why are why are the manufacturers, the auto manufacturers, going along with the whole the whole process, the whole scheme? Well, I think that's a good question, and it's one I put to them directly. I meet with the car companies on a regular basis. The the expression that I hear repeatedly is they felt they had a gun to their head, and by that I think they are referring to the threat of a California opt-out, California waiver. We've talked about the balkanization of the marketplace, but the cost associated with meeting individual standards across the 50 states would be overwhelming. So the threat of the California waiver is very real and very scary. And, and you've had you've had individuals who represent the uh, auto manufacturers tell you this personally. Yes, absolutely. Okay, I thank the gentleman. I want to thank our panel for uh, the great uh, uh, great hearing and uh, Mr. Anwell. I don't know if this is uh, out of order or not, but I, I do it a couple. It is, but go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, I just I wanted to characterize again my testimony is not saying that consumers don't care about fuel economy because that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is they care about other things more. Exactly. And the exactly. second thing I would like to offer for the written record would be. Uh, copies of peer vetted academic research that actually do show that what consumers say in polls and what they do in the real world are not the same yeah. thing. And I feel that that might be a public benefit, uh, you know, as an outsider from, uh, yeah. from, wa from Washington. Without objection, <laughs> Fuller. And maybe. Since, since we are going down the list, go ahead, Mr. Okay. Fuller. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I, there is was, there was a cartoon that I would like to send the committee which uh, shows a man who looks very depressed and his friend says, What is wrong? And he says, Well, 
um, everybody I talk to lies to me. Why are you a you know a defense attorney? No, I'm a pollster. There we go. Um, but the a point that I would like to make um, uh, in regard to um, Chairman Ice's question about an unfunded mandate, you see it. <clears throat> if I remember the figure from Mr. Huang's testimony, EPA and NHTSA are saying that the truck driver will save something like $68,000 over the lifetime of the truck, uh, netting out all the, all the costs with the savings. The, Mr. Greener is right. disagree, but... Right, okay. Now, the problem, though, is that what if, what if EPA and NHTSA are wrong? What if, what if the reliability problems that Mr. Greenearth talked about are just, are just horrendous, and, and he actually ends up with the short end of the stick, paying more for a truck that costs him more to operate? And then what about the, the manufacturer who then finds that there's no market for these vehicles? It's, if EPA and NHTSA were actually providing a guarantee, we guarantee that you will save $68,000 over the life of the truck, and if not, we will refund your purchase to yeah. that amount. You know, it would be a whole different story. But the, my point is that the agencies don't assume any of the risk. And we know that when people make decisions, including regulatory decisions, and other people bear all the risks, well, then factors like ideology get to play a bigger part than prudence. Well said. In the spirit of bipartisanship, I'll give you 30 seconds, Mr. <coughs> Mr. Wong and Mr. Greenearth. Uh, One last quick statement, because we got we do want to get to our next panel quickly, because I have to leave shortly. Yeah, I must appreciate it, Chairman Jordan. Um, I, I will just say, in terms of your request for the safety data, that's all in my testimony, and I'm glad to provide the committee with even more data, and I'm also glad to provide uh, the testimony, uh, the press release from a safety expert named Clarence Ditlow, who okay. reinforces Great. my position. Screen Earth. Yes, absolutely. Appreciate it. Um, I just say it, earlier, Mr. Cassinch was asking about the cost in uh, Ohio and all that. It's we're talking about basically fifty thousand dollars being added to the cost of a vehicle. That is a huge problem for someone, small business owner. And regarding EPA's attitude about this and not including truck drivers, to me, it's as if they, uh, your your doctor, would give you a drug without consulting you. You know, they're they're trying to force us to take this medicine, if you will, that we have no idea what's going to happen. It's unproven technology we're going to rely on, and that could be fatal right. to my business. Thank you very much for taking the time to come today, Mr. Greenfield, and all of you as well. We appreciate a great, great uh, witness panel. We'll quickly get ready for the next panel because we have to move very, very fast. I just may say, hey, bro, really nice. Yeah, nice to meet you. Yeah. Take good care. Enjoy California. I'm a California. Hey, uh, nice to Maybe back in order. Let's uh, 
we'll get. I, I want to thank our, our our witnesses for being here and for the uh, your patience. Uh, that we thought the first panel was great, and we had, uh, as you could see, a full committee. Um, but we now want to welcome you. Our first uh, witness is the Honorable David Strickland. He's the administrator of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Uh, we also have with us the Honorable Gina McCarthy, who is the Assistant Administrator for the Office of Air and Radiation at the Environmental Protection Agency, and uh, also uh, Mrs. Margot O'Gay, who is the Director of the Office of Transportation and Air Quality at the, uh, at the EPA. So let's quickly swear you in. Please stand, raise your right hand. You solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So just answer in the affirmative. All right, let the record show that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Mr. Strickland, you know the routine here. You got five minutes fire away with that high tech uh, gadget there in front of you. Transportation and Department of Transportation. Actually, I was asked a question. Do you know how to use a mic? I was about to say, after several years of doing this, I forget to press it. Thank you so much for your indulgence. But thank you on the part of Secretary LaHood and the entire Department of Transportation and my staff, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, we appreciate this opportunity to testify before you today on our efforts to improve the corporate average fuel economy or CAFE standards. Now, this joint rulemaking with the Environmental Protection Agency highlights the very best in the rulemaking process. This process created greater transparency with early technological engagement with stakeholders assisted these agencies to develop the most informed proposal possible to maximize economic and environmental benefits without impacting safety or vehicle choice. Now, um, Ms. McCarthy and Ms. Ogay will speak to a lot of aspects about our work and process-wise. I want to take my time in oral statement to talk about the safety perspective, which is my agency's core mission. We at the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration do not require any manufacturer to do anything that would have a negative impact on safety. Past safety trade-offs occurred because manufacturers chose at the time to build smaller and lighter vehicles to help them meet the CAFE standards in years past. Staying true to our safety first mission, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration moved from a flat fuel economy standard that subjects each manufacturer to a single standard regardless of differences in their product mix to an attribute-based standard. This attribute system, which uses the vehicle's footprint as the foundation for the standard, was then mandated by the Energy Independence and Security Act in 2007. Under this revised system, cars and light trucks have fuel economy targets based on a specific vehicle's footprint, which is roughly the area between the points at which the tires touch the ground. As a result, manufacturers no longer have an incentive to try to average out sales of larger vehicles by producing more small vehicles. Every additional small vehicle actually increases a manufacturer's overall compliance obligation under the new attribute system. In our analysis, then, we try to make sure that the proposed standards are safety neutral in two ways. First, we set footprint-based standards that do not encourage manufacturers to build smaller vehicles to even out the larger ones. And second, although manufacturers can choose whatever technologies they want to meet our standards, we demonstrate that in our analysis that there is a feasible technology path that the industry could pursue to meet the standards that do not require unsafe levels of mass reduction the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration will be continuing this safety neutral approach in the upcoming CAFE proposal as we undertook this work in model year standards for 2012 through 2016. Now, in addition to building on the safety efforts that we founded in 2012 to 2016, working in collaboration with the Environmental Protection Agency, we also were tasked to make sure that this process had the ability to pull forward the hard work that we achieved in model years 2012 to 2016 very successfully. That work was almost 14 constant months, and frankly, the work for, the, for model years 2017 to 2025 has actually been a very intensive and very transparent two-month effort. After several milestones, including the notice of intent that was issued in September of last year, also the Joint Interim Technical Assessment Report, we 
along with the Environmental Protection Agency, looked at the potentials of cost, effectiveness, and lead time requirements for over 30 technologies that could be applied towards the new standards in 2025. These particular assessments describe the agency's initial assessment of what could be done. Recognizing that, we received comments from more than 30 organizations and more than 100,000 individuals. Following this opportunity for public notice and comment through these processes, we published a supplemental notice of intent in December 2010, which highlighted many of the key comments received in response to the initial notice of intent and to the initial technical assessment report. It is that work, us and the Environmental Protection Agency, working in consultation with the California Air Resources Board, where we undertook an opportunity to have a forward-reaching opportunity to speak to key stakeholders to better inform the upcoming proposal for model years 2017 to 2025. This is something exactly that the President of the United States asked for us to do in his executive order and frankly shows the best aspects of how rulemakers should be made clear, transparent, and forward-thinking. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Um, Ms. McCarthy, you are you're welcome to go. Uh, Chairman Jordan, uh, members of the committee, first, thank you for inviting Margot and Oge to testify today about motor vehicle regulations that are being developed jointly by EPA and NHTSA that will reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve fuel economy for cars and light-duty trucks, as well as medium and heavy-duty trucks and engines. These motor vehicle regulations are a great success story for this country. They will save consumers and small businesses money. They will lower the cost of transporting goods. They will reduce our dependence on foreign oil. And they will help protect the environment. Combined, the mo uh, model year 2011 to 2025 light duty vehicles are estimated to save Americans $1.7 trillion in fuel costs and reduce our need for oil by a total of 12 billion barrels. Ultimately, our savings will reach nearly 4 million barrels a day. That is almost as much as we import from all, all OPEC com countries combined. The regulations are supported by a wide variety of stakeholders, including the industries they regulate, the labor unions representing workers in those industries, environmentalists and states. The first of these regulations was last year's joint EPA NHTSA rulemaking for model year 2012 to 2016 vehicles. This national program allows manufacturers to build a single national fleet that satisfies EPA, NHTSA and California standards. It is common sense, good government approach that harmonizes three different regulatory programs. EPA standards for model year 2016 light duty vehicles are project projected to achieve an average tailpipe CO2 compliance level of 250 grams of carbon dioxide per mile, equivalent to a fuel economy level of 35.5 mile per gallon if they are met only through fuel economy improvements. Over the lifetime of the vehicles, these standards are projected to save 1.8 billion barrels of oil and reduce greenhouse gas emissions by about 960 million metric tons. Consumers and small businesses buying model year 2016 vehicles are projected to average net savings of $3,000 over the life of the vehicle, with those fuel savings far outweigh the initial additional cost of the vehicle. We are now working on the President's request to extend this national program to 2017 to 2025 vehicles. This past July, we published a preliminary framework for this program, including standards that could lead to a projected EPA, EPA fleet-wide model year 2025 compliance level of 163 grams per mile CO2, which is equivalent to 54.5 mile per gallon if reductions were achieved through fuel economy improvements. We project these standards set at these levels would reduce greenhouse gas emissions by approximately 2 million metric tons and save 4 billion barrels of oil over the lifetime of the vehicles, while still allowing consumers to have access to the full range of vehicle choices that they have today. The preliminary elements of the 2017 to 2025 program were informed by extensive public process over the course of the past year. That included publication of a technical assessment of a range of standards, several notices published in the Federal Register, and extensive dialogue with a wide range of stakeholders. The program is supported by letters from no less than 13 CEOs of auto companies, as well as the California Air Resources Board, which again, in 10 
intends to accept compliance with the Federal program as meeting California standards. EPA and NHTSA will soon publish a joint notice of proposed rulemaking, seek an additional public comment before making any final decision on the 2017 to 2025 greenhouse gas and CAFE standards. The third set of regulations is a joint EPA and NHTSA rulemaking that established greenhouse gas and fuel efficiency standard for model year 2014 to 2018, medium and heavy duty trucks and engines. Supporters of this program include engine and truck manufacturers, the American Trucking Association, environmental groups in California. We estimate that these standards will save about 530 million barrels of oil. They will reduce CO2 emissions by about 270 million metric tons and help vehicle owners achieve $50 billion in total fuel savings over the lifetime of these vehicles. A semi-truck operator could pay for the technology upgrades in under a year and realize net savings of $73,000 to reduce fuel costs over the truck's useful life. Efforts like this national program represent monumental achievement for America and American families. History has shown that we can clean up pollution, preserve jobs, help grow our economy, all at the same time. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to provide the agency's views on this matter, and I look forward to answering questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Administrator. Uh, we will go first to the gentlelady from uh, New York, Ms. Emory Burke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our panelists for being here this morning. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I've spent most of my professional uh, career in health, and so safety is of utmost importance to me. And as, as I mentioned in the previous panel, I have six children and soon to be 12 grandchildren, so safety is always on my mind when you're putting kids in a car. Um, Mr. Strickland, you talked about one of the ways to increase efficiency and decrease the use of, of fuel is decreasing the weight of a car. And, and I'm concerned, can you talk to me about um, the safety impacts resulting from making fleets smaller and lighter? Well, absolutely. Well, the goal is... Um, is your microphone on? Yeah, uh, yes, it is. I apologize. I need to step a little closer here. The goal is actually to not encourage mass reduction, but actually to use fuel economy improvements through driving technology, which is the reason why uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration went to an attribute-based standard, I believe, for our last set of truck rules prior to 12 through 16, which I think for light-duty trucks, which was, I believe, in 2005. That system was actually um, not only validated, but actually mandated by the Congress in 2007. When you have a flat standard, which is basically one rule covering the entire manufacturer's individual fleet, that encouraged um, car companies at the time to offset larger vehicles by making more smaller vehicles. Okay. This attribute-based system actually discourages that. And what you do is you don't take out weight. Actually, what you do is you encourage manufacturers to reduce weight in their largest vehicles. So not only do you have the possibility... Okay, I, I don't mean to interrupt. Oh, certainly. Go ahead. Five minutes goes by so quickly. Mrs. Uh, O'Gay, I'd like to just follow up with you. With regards to the EPA and, and the concern for uh, this fuel efficiency, what if um, the number of increase in fatalities and injuries goes up? W at what point does the EPA say, and maybe this isn't such a smart idea, maybe this fuel efficiency approach is to the detriment of safety, and, and we, so it's, we're going to back off of this? Uh, thank you for no, uh, the talk. Like the talk. Uh, thank you for the question. Actually, this is a question that uh, should go to Mr. Strickland. Uh, the beauty of the two agencies working together is that we were able to bring the expertise of two, our two technical teams. EPA has extensive expertise for the past 40 years uh, to regulate the car companies for emissions, and it has significant expertise in the area of, of safety. So um, working together, uh, we're going to put a proposal together that will uh, demonstrate well, that so this let is me just a safety-neutral uh, proposal. So EPA is setting these standards without, without having the expertise re with regards to safety issues? Uh, we have, we, under the Clean Air Act, we are required to, to look at safety, and we do that, so we have our own expertise. But also NHTSA has that expertise, so we rely on NHTSA when it comes to the fuel economy greenhouse gas program. So based on that, would you just in, tell me 
what EPA's position is with regards to safety. We always do benefits and burdens analysis. And so we want fuel efficiency, but we also want safety. So what's EPA's? At what point do you say, let's back off from this fuel efficiency issue because it's jeopardizing safety? As, as it will become evident from the proposal, uh, the proposal will be um, safety neutral. That means we have taken that into consideration is one of the many factors that both agencies have to evaluate. Okay. We, we have evidence to the contrary. Mr. Strickland, I'll, I'll just go back to you, mm -hmm. because you mentioned that these studies, these safety studies were continuing on. And, and I think it's important for you to, if you are willing to do this, to commit to, to this committee, to this committee that if, in fact, um, y this final rule isn't going to be issued until and unless we know what the safety, the impact on safety is going to be. Are you willing to commit that to this committee today? That is part of our statutory responsibility, Congresswoman. Bottom line. No, that, that wasn't my question. Would you be willing to, to not issue a final rule until and unless all of the safety studies have been completed and we understand what the impact of these fuel efficiency standards are going to be on safety? And the issue is for us to be able to have the most complete information possible before we as an agency make a recommendation to Secretary LaHood about a final rule, of course, or a proposal for that matter. So the question of all the studies being completed, if the agency feels that we have enough technical information on hand to make a very educated decision in terms of proposal, we will go forward with that. So you are not willing to commit that we are not going to get all the safety studies done first before we issue the final rule. We will have all the appropriate safety studies done to make a decision, Congresswoman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to introduce into the record a letter from uh, Mark Pryor, Senator Pryor, um, a letter to him uh, from Ray LaHood. Uh, Without objection. Thank you. Uh, I see my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, Strickland, is the uh, fuel efficiency standard for NHTSA uh, in year 2025, 49.6 miles per gallon. Is that going to be the, the standard? Actually, that's what known as if actually it's virtually a conditional target. We are not allowed to set standards for more than five year period. Where does that number come from then? It's number? actually so it's the work collectively done with us and the Environmental Protection Agency in terms of the technological reviews that we're doing initially. Now at this particular point we but still is have that the open, number? Is that the number that it is we have open notice and comment not only to have to go through for the initial part of the rule for twenty seventeen to twenty twenty one we, under statutory obligation, under the Ener Energy Independence and Security Act, we have to go through another open notice and comment period. We have to literally do another set of rulemaking. So we do not have a set endpoint standard. We can't by law. Anything and on NHTSA uh, letterhead or anything that points to that number, 49.6 miles per gallon? There is an estimated, we believe that the long-term program has the ability at this point to achieve that. You know, but once again, that has to be evaluated okay. under the. Under so that's the a, that's a standard that's at least out there and proposed and being talked about and subject to maybe being the number. It's a similar issue as an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking okay. under the APA, which is you can definitely have a perspective number for thinking about planning purposes and also for okay. the long term purposes and is the, for the manufacturers. Uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. McCarthy is um, is the number that the EPA has fifty four point five. That is the number uh, that we have put out in a framework that, that is initially guiding our thought uh, so based on public information that has been out in the record. So is there, I guess that begs the question, then, is there one national standard? Is there going to be one standard as we are looking ahead, is it, is there, or is there going to be two? 49.6, that one federal agency is saying, 54.5, that another federal agency is saying. What, because one of the things I hear, and, and look, I have been hearing for two years when I talk to business owners in our district and, frankly, across the state of Ohio. Is it's the word that comes up more and more often. You hear it from elected officials. Is the uncertainty in the marketplace with business owners today? So wouldn't you, wouldn't it seem like maybe if there is supposed to be one national standard, we wouldn't want two numbers out there? Well, the success of the 2012 to 2016 program was that for the first time we did have one national program, which means we had three regulatory agencies that worked together so that one national fleet. Could be produced that would achieve. My, my all question of the is, though, do you think that adds to uncertainty the fact that there is not one standard, at least in the proposed numbers and, and, the, and the target that uh, manufacturers are going to have to hit? I think the manufacturers are well aware that for the first time they can build one, one fleet that achieves all of the regulatory requirements. That is the first time yeah. that we have been able to deliver it. That is why they asked us to look beyond 2016 and actually get together to okay. extend that national. Let, let, let me go to this then. So the, the, the process. 
Mr. And you were all here for the first panel. Mr. Greenearth talked about uh, during the comment period for the, the, the truck industry where he felt like he was not heard at all and talked about the additional cost he now faces as a uh, small business uh, owner. And Mr. Anwil, in his comments, talked about how he's, he thinks the deal is already done now as we're moving forward with the new set of standards coming. Um, how do you respond to that, that here, here are folks, consumer advocates, uh, small business owners, who feel, feel like that they are not actually having their concerns addressed in the process and the, and the deal is already done? The deal is not done. We still have to propose. Bottom line, what we did was ask for stakeholders to provide us technical information to better inform the proposal. So everyone that was here that provided you testimony, we are looking forward to seeing their comments in our open notice and comment period when we issue the proposal. Once again, also I believe that the uh, OIDA, which is I think the group that Mr. Greenrose actually did have meetings not only with my technical team but also with the EPA, and I can have Ms. McCarthy answer more specifically to that. Um, but in terms of hearing particular voices or the consumer's voice or things of that nature, that's what open notice and comment is for. And our doors were always open throughout this process. While there was numbers of technical meetings that were going on with lead stakeholders, there was other meetings going on all the time, again, we were taking it up for the process. Mr. Anwil was always welcome if he had his study to be able to provide that to the agency, to provide that to EPA. We would happily have taken that into consideration in the preliminary look in making and shaping the proposal, and especially, more importantly, during open notice and comment, which is where well, we have to evaluate all this. I, I appreciate that, all, uh, Director. But the, uh, you know, they, we had two people under oath just testify that they felt it didn't work the way you just described. We have this statement from the Center for Progressive Reform, which says the center notes that the agreed-upon CAFE standards are, quote, the result of raw political wrangling, not the rational rulemaking process. So this is not some, you know, small business. Owner. This is a, a probably center-left organization making that kind of statement. We had Mr. Anwal under testimony before saying uh, he called it the, bulk, the California balkanization issue, uh, talking about manufacturing. I think the statement he used was he felt like the manufacturers had a gun to their head and they felt they had to go along with uh, the proposed standards. So um, how do you respond to that? Well, I can't speak to the state of mind to a manufacturer. I mean, you need to ask them how they felt. How about, how about, how about uh, Administrator McCarthy? Mm -hmm. uh, well, first of all, I would say that the, the national program has garnered such widespread support because it is a model of how government can and should work effectively with a r wide range of stakeholders to develop thoughtful data-driven regulations that benefit consumers, that improve the environment, that improve a lot of the a lot of the test, A lot of the questioning but, but, in the first, in the, if I could but, just real quickly, uh, 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 Ms. Brown, the, a lot of the questioning in the first panel was on the cost uh, issue. Did you guys, when you go through this, you, you did a pretty, I would assume, a pretty extensive cost-benefit analysis? We of what did, and we will provide a similar analysis when we put out the proposed rule. And is there a chance the committee could get that cost-benefit analysis that you have used thus far to arrive at the, the uh, decisions you have actually, arrived at? Actually, all of that information is in the public record already. We actually put out a notice of intent. We put out a technical uh, assessment report. We put out a supplemental. And you will get that all to the committee? Intent. Can you get that to the committee? And, and supplemental. Absolutely. It is okay. in the public record. Okay. The only thing I would also say is I know that one of the representatives you heard from this morning was OIDA. And I wanted to make it very clear to you that we actually met with OIDA extensively. They early on identified seven issues that were of concern to them in our proposal. And I can provide you direct information that indicated that their comments led to significant changes in the final because we took their comments into consideration. In fact, I can provide to you an email from OIDA subsequent to our meeting with them during a the comment period in which they went on effusively about how good EPA was to pay such close attention to the interests of small business. Mm -hmm. So I don't know who this representative was or how extensive an involvement he had in the process, but clearly not working for OIDA because the staff for OIDA met with us, appreciated it, and had an influence in the decision. All right. Gentlelady from New York for a second round. We'll go real quickly second round then. Thank you, Mr. Pico. Chairman. Um, just as a follow-up question to the Chairman's question, um, Ms. McCarthy, with regards to, you, you, you sat there and you were quick to tick off all the benefits, saving uh, billions, seven, 12 billion barrels of oil with these new standards. Can you give us some idea of the cost? 
Uh, certainly. The, the costs are, are in the rulemaking themselves, and, and let me talk to you a little bit about the costs. Just, just the amount. Just the Re amount relative the to 2012 to 2016, the cost for those model years is $52 billion. The monetized benefits are $240 billion. For the estimated, we haven't proposed it yet. We don't have any costs yet for the 2017 to 2025. But if you look in the, in the record, you will see that the notice of intent that we put out actually references a wide variety of costs related to different ranges of stringency in those rules. For the 2014 to 2016, uh, Heavy-duty vehicles, the cost is $8 billion. The monetized benefits are $50 billion. Okay. If you, yes, if you could prepare, um, provide those for the committee, that would be Happy great. To. Thank you. Mr. Strickland, I, I want to go back a little bit because it sounds to me like we're going to have three different standards here. There's three different programs, Congresswoman. It's one harmonized national program. There's different authorities under the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Clean Air Act Authority under EPA, and then the California Air Resources Board also has the ability, because of the waiver and the engagement finding, to issue their own rules regarding greenhouse gas emissions. The key to it was, was to harmonize those three different authorities. So while, yes, there are three different regulatory actions happening, they are jointly done and coordinated, so you do have one harmonized national program. Right. Just can you comment, though, this California waiver? Doesn't that create – why was California given a waiver? What, doesn't that create confusion? This harmony, there's three different sets of standards. It wasn't that way before 2009, and I'd like you to comment on that. Well, I'll defer to Ms. McCarthy and EPA on no. that, since they're the ones that have to process the waiver. No, but my question is directed to you, Mr. Oh, Strickland, and then I'll follow up with the other two. In terms of why I think there's – well, clearly because California was giving the waiver, they have the authority um, because of their endangerment finding, uh, the endangerment finding made by the Environment Protection Agency to be able to issue greenhouse gas standards. And therefore, under Mass v. EPA, which gave the, gave the Clean Air Act authority the right to actually to oversee transportation sources, we have a new regulatory environment that we have to deal with. The White House and the President's leadership said for all of us that through a, a various statements of presidential orders to be able to work together to create one national harmonized program, and that's what we did. But I'd like you to comment on the fact that the EPA really in issuing this waiver to California violated the state preemption, that, that this California should not have been given a waiver. I am not an expert on California waiver issues. I'm, I would be happily to answer that for the record specifically, but you have two experts to my left. Well, but, but you're working with these groups, and it's, it's of concern to me that whether EPA had the authority to grant this waiver to California, now we end up in a situation where we've got three sets of standards where in 2009 we had one set and that was NHTSA standard, which appears to be a more reasonable and, and you know, less, less onerous and less burdensome uh, on, on the economy and on the folks, as you heard from this morning. We were given congressional authority under EPCA in the mid-70s and then, and, then, and then modified by the Energy Independence Security Act in 2007. We will carry out those duties. Because of Mass v. EPA and the Clean Air Act authority, there is independent authority as well to also regulate greenhouse gas emissions, and it is not our place to evaluate the Environmental Protection Agency's legal authority. Our responsibility on the Department of Transportation is to actually to deal with our statutory authorities, and our agency's mission is to not only regulate fuel economy, which is one part of our mission, but to find the best ways to save lives and reduce injuries, which is what we do every single day. I would disagree with you on the fact that you should have knowledge that, and you should be concerned with the fact that EPA violated the state preemption by granting California that waiver, and that should be the place where you start. It was it was uh, in EPCA, and, it, and there was a state preemption clause in there. So my concern is that, and that's why we're having this hearing. We're not well, saying we don't well, want a clean environment. Well, we're not saying we don't. But we want to make sure that this process that was followed is legal and is the right way to go. Well, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Madam Vice Chairman, would you li like me to answer this question? Yeah, the, I mean, I think the question is, the, yep. the, the statute seems to indicate that you can't have preemption, and yet the EPA said you can't have preemption. So what, what gives? Actually, I, I believe that what you're referring to are fuel economy regulations. What, what California is regulating and what EPA is regulating are greenhouse gas emission standards. And the only thing that I wanted to make sure to point out is that Congress in the Clean Air Act in Section 209 actually not only gave us the authority 
to grant California waivers, but it, it gave us specific criteria that we needed to follow. We applied those criteria to the letter. We went through a public well, rulemaking I guess, process. I guess here's, maybe here's the question. I'm not, I'm not some legal scholar on this, but it, it seems when you read the statute, it talks about a regulation related to fuel economy standards, and greenhouse gases are certainly related to fuel economy standards. Is that right? They, they, are ve they are closely aligned, but they are and I different. I think that proves the gentle lady's point. Ma Mr. Chairman, we actually take into consideration all greenhouse gas emissions related to that vehicle. Most notably, the major difference is the air conditioning. Um, and, th and that makes a very big difference in terms of the outcome of these rules. EPA's regulation actually improves the amount of greenhouse gases you can, can get and achieve through this joint rulemaking, and it also helps improve fuel economy in the end. But we are not driving fuel economy. We are actually regulating greenhouse gases. I want to go back to where I was earlier because uh, I wasn't quite clear. Are, is there one one standard or are, are, are there are going to be two? Are there going to be 49 miles per gallon or N54? Uh, are there going to be two numbers out there or is there going to just be one number? Well, the easiest way to explain it is the 54.5 mile per gallon standard derived from the EPA's greenhouse gas rules versus NHTSA's 49.6, they're actually harmonized. They are the same number. We have different authorities. They have more flexibilities. Mr. 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 Strickland, only in Washington could you say two numbers are the same number. I mean, I've never heard. I mean, I've seen all kinds of things in budgeting. It's a where, harmonized. It's a harmonized. We're going to cut spending, but we're not cutting spending. A, we're reducing the rate of growth. I mean, every I've seen it all, and I've only been here five years, and I've seen it all. But I've never had someone, federal agencies, say forty nine point six is the same as fifty four point five. I've just never seen it. There's different statutory authorities and different flexibilities that the agencies have. When you well, let me, let me, then will you at least admit this that that probably doesn't help the uncertainty that that currently exists in our economy, where we got nine percent unemployment? Would you at least admit that? No, the exact reason you why we so. needed wow. to work okay. on the exact reason why we needed a harmonized national program is to address exactly that, so the auto manufacturers can actually address building one national fleet. It is what the manufacturers wanted. It is the best environmental policy and it is best economic policy. The reason why we've undertaken this joint rulemaking in the first place is to address that very question. Bottom line is: Would you ever have had to undertake the joint rulemaking if? Uh, California didn't have a different standard. Well, clearly the issue is is that. I mean, no, just be just be frank. I mean, you're under oath, or just be frank. If it, but for that, you wouldn't have had to do this, would you? Well, before we Mass wouldn't have had this whole before, convoluted rulemaking well, process where you had this special Mr. committee, Chairman, you had Mr. Mass Bloom. EPA, the only auto fuel regulator was NHTSA. So you're asking a question which sort of bespokes in that was in the current reality. The current reality is is that the Supreme Court made the decision that the Clean Air Act did cover mobile transportation sources, and frankly, not only because of that legal decision, it frankly was the best policy decision, because there are some things that the environmental protection agencies, such as air conditioning, can reach, which actually strengthens our fuel economy policy, makes it more consistent, and actually makes it a more rigorous standard. I want to thank the, the, the witnesses. You got another? I, I do have to run. I appreciate you coming in, and, and I apologize. I can't say, but I got to get to another meeting here. So. I just we'll have, turn it over to the gentlelady from uh, New York. And, and I just have yourself. a quick question for the three of you. It's a yes or no question, if you wouldn't mind. Um, is are the greenhouse gas rules, either the uh, EPA's or the California rules, are they related to fuel economy, Mr. Strickland? They regulate. Yes or no? No, they regulate greenhouse gas emissions. They regulate greenhouse gas emissions. They regulate greenhouse gas emissions. So they're not related to uh, to fuel economy under oath. under oath. No, the greenhouse gas emissions regulations. We do not regulate fuel economy standards. Okay, and that you all three of you agree with that? Yes. 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 Very good. Uh, I this hearing is adjourned. Thank you all very much for being here. Thank you, Madam Vice Chairman. Ha, ha, ha.